The data are indicating something weird is, I believe, not controversial at this stage. Why is Big Bang in my 10 great ideas? Well, it's symbolic. It's symbolic of something which makes us uniquely human, our inquisitiveness. And it's that which drives us, through science, forward. We've had the audacity to tackle outer space, but we've had the nerve to take on inner space too. My final three advances are all about understanding us. Starting with a remarkable book published in the year 2000. Hundred and fifteen volumes like this contain the printout of the human genome from just one individual. Three billion letters, it's the recipe for what makes you who you are. It will revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. Ten years ago, decoding the human genome was hailed by many as significant as putting a man on the moon, a symbol of hope for the new millennium. The reason for all the hope, and some would even say hype, was partly because of the enormous potential of gene therapy. Until recently, medicine could do nothing to restore broken or malfunctioning genes. But today, there are some procedures which can offer hope. Ten-year-old Abdullahi is about to undergo an operation which might change his genetic destiny. Abdullahi has poor vision, particularly poor night vision, because he lacks one of the genes essential for converting light energy into a nerve impulse. So the, the idea of this operation is to provide his retina with the correct functioning copy of that gene. And in order to do that, we um, package the genes themselves into a harmless virus. But to get the virus to the right place, we need to inject the virus underneath the retina. Though his surgeon isn't certain how effective this cutting-edge treatment will be, without intervention, Abdullahi could eventually become totally blind. But what this remarkable procedure hopes to achieve is nothing less than delivering a new undamaged section of the DNA to do the work of Abdullahi's faulty gene. The good news is that since the operation, Abdullahi's vision has improved. It's a small step on the gene therapy journey, but its champions believe it could eventually have benefits for a great number of us. Could he? It's got hundreds and thousands on it, hasn't it? Yeah. Like about 10% of children in the UK, Millie and Ruby suffer from asthma. But while both girls have the condition, Millie responds a lot better to medication than her sister. You've got a bit of a cough, haven't you? Do you always have a cough? For Ruby, attacks result in endless dashes to hospital and could be fatal. literally use nothing you can do to help your child. You just think at some point, is she going to stop breathing? Is the, you know, they're coughing so much they're being sick, and then the breathing becomes worse, and then you know you're, you're going to hospital, basically, and you know, it's the worst feeling you can ever imagine. But Ruby's quite a resilient character. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. That, yeah. She's amazing. Even, even when she's at her worst, she gives you a smile. Millie and Ruby are taking part in a research project which is trying to discover why some patients are easier to treat than others. Over 100,000 children in the United Kingdom with asthma carry a particular gene change which seems to make them much less responsive towards the commonest asthma reliever inhaler, the blue inhaler that we use. Swabs are taken so that the girl's DNA their genes can be examined. Give it more. All right. The hope is 
that medicines can be matched to genes and that the current trial and error approach of treating people like Ruby will be a thing of the past. The dream is that eventually we'll all be treated with medicines that are a perfect match for our own unique DNA. The technology that's developed since the Human Genome Project means that decoding an individual's genome is becoming easier and affordable. Genetic knowledge is a new frontier and our understanding of how genes work is one of the most significant medical advances since the time of ancient Greece. The methods it employs have applications that will revolutionize the treatment of disease. Scientists working in this lab at Imperial College are trying to find a cure for a devastating human disease. But they're not developing medicines. They're trying to understand how to grow new tissues. My colleague Michael Schneider is a world leader in this research. Wow. And he and his team have made a remarkable advance. They've created beating heart cells from scratch. When you first looked down the microscope and saw a heart cell beating, what was your reaction? Well, when you see a cluster like this beating vigorously in the dish, it obviously stimulates your thinking about how to apply that information uh, to the complicated task of cardiac muscle repair in a clinical setting. Ten days ago, those kinds of cells were undifferentiated embryonic stem cells that can become any cell in the body without restriction. Stem cells are among the first cells produced when an egg is fertilized. Though they start off looking the same, they soon turn into very different things. Bone, muscle, hair, teeth, nerves. All the different cell types that make up a human being. By understanding how these transformations work, scientists like Michael are trying to find out how to repair damaged or diseased organs. How important is this work in the field of stem cell biology? Well, 40% of the people watching this program will die of cardiovascular disease. Taking that together with the fact that heart disease boils down to cell death without cell replacement, uh, that makes cardiac repair by stem cells one of the most important and promising areas for stem cell research. So far, there have been few treatments developed because of work on stem cells. But some researchers even hope that eventually they'll be able to grow replacement organs, or at least help the body repair itself. A tiny minority are opposed to human embryo research because it damages human embryos. They have a point, but to my mind, it's actually an ethical imperative to try to save lives. And this is one way of doing it. My final scientific advance is very close to my heart. It's something to which I've devoted most of my career. Every single one of these children's lives began in a test tube or a dish. They are IVF children. They come from eggs fertilized not in the womb, but in the laboratory. God, that was really frightening. None of them would be here if it wasn't for scientific research into the earliest stages of life. Well, it's sort of pink, yes, it's not really red. Would you allow pink, then? No? You're very particular. And although I was involved in that research, I have to confess that at the time, I didn't appreciate its significance. I didn't think it was really going to be very important. I didn't think that IVF was a technology that would really make any difference to infertility treatment. Look how wrong I was. All these babies, there are about a million IVF babies around the world. In the 1980s, my colleagues and I developed an experimental IVF technique to screen for genetic diseases in the developing embryo. Christine Mundy's first son, Justin, was severely handicapped, and it was discovered that she carries a genetic condition which means it's very likely that any of her male children would inherit the same problems. 
we've been trying for nine years to, for this breakthrough to, to come so we could have another chance. In 1990, we screened her fertilized embryos to ensure that she had a girl. Rebecca is now 19. Your mum was wonderfully brave. I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> because what we were doing was a, a very, very um, experimental procedure and we had no idea whether it was going to work or not. Do you remember, we couldn't guarantee no. that you might not have a child that was affected. No. To us, it wasn't really brave, you know. The baby could have been damaged in some way, but I never, ever worried about that side of it at all. I had my whole confidence that you would actually get it right. Yeah, funny, isn't it? Mm. I don't think I had that confidence. No, no. <laughs> well... <laughs> Does having been born as a result of the in vitro fertilisation make you feel any different? I'm quite humbled. <laughs> for our family, it's been quite crucial for this breakthrough. You know? Mm, of course, of course. Because so mm. I wouldn't have Rebecca today if mm. it wasn't for mm. that. Mm. She doesn't always say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's genuinely a very, very moving occasion, actually, to me. It's very special for me. 20 years ago, there was considerable opposition from people hoping to stop such work. Was that you? But in the UK, legislation was hugely positive. And it has enabled us to give hope, not just to many people like Christine, but also to hundreds of thousands of families who otherwise couldn't have had children. Well, that concludes my list. Now it's time for you to have your say. Which of the 10 scientific advances that we've looked at do you think is the most important? Is it the millions of lives created by IVF? Or the huge promise of stem cell research? Is your favorite the life-saving MRI machine? Or the mighty microchip? Do you think the contraceptive pill has done more for us than the giant laser ever will? Or is it our ability to rebuild ourselves with bionics that inspires you the most? Can you say the global power of the internet beats the huge potential of understanding more about our genes? Or does the mind-boggling Big Bang Theory trump them all? Go to our website to vote for the scientific advance you think has been the most significant. Visit bbc.co.uk forward slash science. There's a reminder of the top 10 advancements on the website. But before you vote online, I feel I should put my cards on the table. Well, I'm reluctant to say which of these 10 advances is my greatest, but just possibly I might plump for research on Big Bang. It might seem useless, yet the knowledge it brings will almost certainly have unforeseen consequences for humanity. Just possibly understanding the universe a little better will help our species to continue to flourish. <laughs>